constitutional law. He might believe the state Supreme Court was mistaken and deserves to be reversed, but he isn't so sure of his views that he wants to ensconce them as a federal constitutional pronouncement that will be very difficult for courts to reverse. So Learned Hand once said that the spirit of liberty is that spirit which is not too sure that it is right. So any justice that shares that sentiment might prefer a state law reversal in a case such as Boy Scouts against Dale or BMW against Gore or other cases. So that's it. You can tell that you're at a Federalist Society event because they, these are all people who respect the rule of law here, which is that they have 10 minutes. So um, <laughs> our final selected paper for the evening is Professor Naomi Rao. Um, Naomi is a professor at George Mason Law School where uh, her research focuses on comparative constitutional law, international law, and jurisprudence. So I guess I'm the final speaker on a long day of speakers. But um, so my article seeks to set out three primary conceptions of dignity or human dignity as used by constitutional courts. And the idea here is to lay out some of the philosophical foundations of these conceptions and also to examine some of the consequences of choosing one conception or another. So just to provide a little bit of brief background, um, since World War II, dignity has really emerged as a preeminent legal or political value. We see it in a number of human rights documents, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about dignity in a number of provisions. It is also in many modern constitutions, such as the German Basic Law, the South African Constitution, and many others. And even in countries such as the United States or Canada, which do not specifically reference dignity in their constitutional documents, um, the courts have managed to introduce this concept of dignity when adjudicating individual rights. And dignity is very much in the air in talking about international rights and constitutional rights. And, and courts are using the term to mean something. And, and so I think it's important to try to figure out what exactly that something is. Because often when it's used, it's really glossing over a number of tensions in other political concepts, such as negative and positive liberty, or liberty and equality, or the demands of the individual versus the demands of the community. So there are three types that I identify in my paper. And I'll say just a little bit about each one. The first is inherent dignity. The, the second type is various substantive conceptions of dignity. And the last is dignity as recognition. So the first type of dignity, inherent dignity, is really the most fundamental. This is the dignity that each person has simply by virtue of being human. It's a kind of universal understanding of dignity that belongs to each person equally. It doesn't depend on their race or their ethnicity, um, their personal merits, their achievements. Um, it's something that we all share simply by virtue of being human. And in a legal context, how this emerges is that this type of dignity is often connected to concepts of negative liberty or individual autonomy. And the examples from this, not surprisingly, come primarily from the United States Supreme Court because constitutional decisions, um, well, I guess the basic idea here is to understand that, that because of this inherent human dignity, the best way to respect inherent human dignity is to give individuals the widest scope of freedom to, to move forward with their actions as they choose. So a few examples of this in the United States, we see the Supreme Court refer to dignity, for instance, in the context of various criminal rights. So in the Fourth Amendment, dignity is often connected to privacy or freedom from unwarranted intrusions by the state. Dignity is a theme that comes up in the Sixth Amendment, right, to self-representation. The idea being that there's a certain dignity in making individual choices or choosing how to represent oneself in court. Um, other examples include the, the sexual privacy cases. So in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the plurality discusses the personal dignity and autonomy central to the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. And in Lawrence versus Texas, the court um, refers to many different conceptions of dignity, at least one of which is the dignity of autonomy, um, the dignity to choose one's you know, sexual behavior and sexual partners. And this concept of dignity is not one that we see very frequently overseas, but it is one that occurs in the United States. Okay, so the second form of dignity is, is sort of a group of, of ideas that I refer to as substantive conceptions of dignity. 
And here what Dignity does is that it promotes certain judgments about the good life. Here Dignity stands for what might be valuable for individuals or for society at large. And constitutional courts will often use these conceptions of dignity to justify various political constraints or to promote certain values or public morality. And, and in this instance, dignity is not about being left alone or left free to do as you will. It's really about being guided towards particular good choices through social policy. So perhaps some examples can, can elucidate this, because I think this may be a less familiar concept um, to American lawyers. So there's a famous French case about dwarf throwing. And in that case, there was a Mr. Wackenheim who made his living by being thrown for sport. And a number of mayors of various French cities found this objectionable, and so they banned the sport of dwarf throwing. So Mr. Wackenheim brought suit, alleging that this violated his economic liberty and his right to earn a living. The French Conseil d'Etat upheld the bans on the grounds that dwarf throwing itself offended human dignity and that maintaining human dignity was part of the public order that could be controlled by the municipal police. And so this is really a paradigmatic example of, of this form of dignity. So what we see is that the public authorities have defined dignity in a particular way. Something like not making a spectacle of oneself, or not embarrassing oneself, or being used in this, in this sort of, in what they consider to be an embarrassing fashion. And what they're doing is they're trying to protect Mr. Wackenheim from what they consider to be his own bad judgment, presumably. And they're also seeking to protect the public order, or the public morality. You know, they don't want French citizens watching this spectacle because it might coarsen them. And unless you think this is a sort of idiosyncratic example, which it is to some, example, is some extent, we see this concept of dignity in a number of, of other types of cases as well. For example, in the Canadian Supreme Court, they refer to these types of notions of dignity in connection with prostitution, for instance, and upholding bans on prostitution because prostitution itself is a degrading activity, even if it's consensual. And they use the same reasoning to uphold their fairly stringent bans on pornography, where they say that making pornography and pornographic images are inherently degrading, even if adults are consenting to, to make the pornography. And, and although I don't have time to fully explain this, the, this, this kind of concept of dignity also comes into play in countries where the Constitution protects various social and economic rights. So there's some concept that leading a dignified life means having a certain minimum standard of living, a standard of living that the state is required to protect in the form of housing or health care or, or what have you. And that brings us to the, the final category, which is dignity is recognition. And I think in many ways in this final category is what modern human dignity is really pushing towards. Um, and here the demand isn't for freedom from interference. It's not the demand um, or it's not the coercion of the state to, to promote dignified behavior. Here the demand is really from, for respect, respect from the, from the state, respect from other private individuals. And the, the philosophical understanding here is not of the autonomous individual, but rather of the socially situated self, the self that's realized through the community. And so if a self is realized through the community, then one's dignity depends very much on how they are recognized by that community. And, and dignity then depends on the attitude of others and one's subjective perceptions of the attitude of others. And this comes into play in, in both the private law and the public law. So in private law, we see things like defamation and libel law, which are sometimes referred to as dignitary torts because they protect individual reputation and dignity. And even though there are certain limits on free speech, um, certain First Amendment limits on those doctrines in the United States, in Europe, there's a very wide-ranging understanding of this, this dignity of reputation and the extent to which it can be protected. Dignity is also one of the underlying justifications for hate speech regulation on the grounds that it protects human dignity not to have hateful speech against individuals of particular groups. And then in the public context, um, perhaps the best example of this sort of dignity as recognition comes in the, in the California and Connecticut state Supreme Court decisions dealing with gay marriage. So in the Connecticut case, the court is very clear that, that the Connecticut civil union law give same-sex couples virtually all of the identical rights of marriage, the same, um, the same benefits, protections, and responsibilities of marriage without the label of marriage. 
And so the court explains, and they discuss this, I think, in, in, some, in some very interesting detail. They say, well, maybe what the harm is here, it might be, seem like a symbolic harm. It might seem like an intangible harm, but really, in fact, it is a harm. It's a dignitary harm to gay couples because their relationships are not recognized in the same way as heterosexual couples. And, um, and that this failure to recognize is itself demeaning and is itself um, a constitutional harm. So whatever one thinks about these claims, I think it's important to see that these claims of dignity are very different um, from the types of claims of dignity as autonomy, which um, in Lawrence, really, these terms, you know, dignity as autonomy and dignity as recognition pointed in the same direction. But that need not always, uh, always be the case. So just to, to wrap up, I'm, the idea is basically that dignity has become a part of our legal lexicon. It's not something I necessarily approve of, but constitutional courts are very fond of this. And if they're going to continue to use the term, I think it's important that we be clear about what's at stake. Thank you. Well, that was impressive. That was literally to the second. So I'm going to serve some extra applause. Um,